Hi, welcome to another exciting Breathing with Beerman. So many guests, so many things to say. And always not enough time. Um, I've been threatened. Before the show's gone on, Kurt Tazler has threatened me. Um, he has a lot of issues in the psyche of his bra that he can. About an old, I used to have a guest called the captain. He, they wanted to beat each other up. Slump story. He threatened me over it and hasn't let it drop. I thought since he had There's a girlfriend. There's a 75 year old lady who wants to beat you up. I thought crap. since he had a girlfriend now and maybe he's. He's had some kind of licentious behavior. You know what, as your lawyer, I have to say, you should not say that. Okay. That's, anyway, we that's have, not what your wife said last night. That took us all. Same thing you. Talk about my mother, at least. We have John W. Hartman. This is a great, up, up. This book was great. Now, as I slowly grow in popularity, I'm getting many more books thrown at me. Self-published, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and bricks, too. Sometimes bricks. And with this book, it was breezy, irreverent, to the point. It gave you a primer how to be a lawyer, and a court with a fascinating life. There's too much to say and too long, so let's get to it. John, thanks for coming. Mark. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, let's start with this. Um, you were the youngest Republican assembly. I was. 1991. I couldn't get a summer job. I was in law school, so I decided to run for the assembly. Got real lucky. Managed to win. I wasn't so lucky the next time around. It was a good experience. When Christmas said to you, who's still congressman, walk in and you win. You went to every single door you put. I hit about 20,000 doors, mostly in Trenton, but uh, some in Princeton. Um, they were going to vote for me anyway around Princeton. But you knocked out Princeton a lot in the book. <laughs> Limousine liberals from hell kind of thing. Uh, but I went about my jury. If you're from Princeton, I want you on a jury. Yeah, we'll get to that one. But, uh, anyway. but did a lot of door-to-door -door right. in, um, in, in the city, and uh, you and Lawrence as well. Mm -hmm. And you won. And that's so funny, though. You said, I, I needed a job, and I couldn't get one, so I became a politician. But then your regard for politicians is somewhat low. Well, you know what? In my I do criminal law, and I, I when I tell people I was in politics before that, people say, "Wow, criminals and politicians are so different." It's like really they're not. The only difference is occasionally a, a criminal will tell you the truth, but mm -hmm. uh, I just don't have a lot of respect for politicians in general. Well, you thought they're written by lobbyists. What what, what didn't you like? Well, I mean, it's a little bit tongue in cheek. Um, you know, what, politics just in a lot of ways brings out the worst in people. Um, I don't know what it is, but it just seems to do that. But I'm I'm happy uh, doing what I'm doing now. I'm happy, quite frankly, being. Show. And somewhere along the line in your big career, you got the idea to write a book. I did. What, what is it about? What is the premise? The premise is that basically, I, when I uh, do a lot of criminal defense work, you meet a lot of shady characters. I represented this one individual who was falsely convicted. The uh, case was overturned on appeal. I took over the case, and I was just very impressed with the man. He uh, refused. Nathaniel, it's actually his real name is Nathaniel Oliver. I was just with him about an hour ago. Um, he refused to plead guilty, really stuck to his principles, stuck to his guns. And uh, we went to trial and we managed to win. To put it in perspective, I've done about 50 jury trials. He is the one individual uh, who I am positive <laughs> was not guilty. Mm -hmm. one individual. And when you talk, it was very scary the way he got um, um, someone robbed at a convenience store. Uh, the witness, the cashier, said a man was like probably six feet or five nine. He was waiting at a bus stop, waiting to go to a second job, probably at Braun, I'm thinking. Montgomery. Exactly. And um, to uh, do some uh, telemarketing. He was in a bad mood. The cop was harassing him. The cop said, well, hey, he's a pain in the butt. I can I clear this file. Let's arrest him. And, yes. some, and somehow they convicted him, grand jury, and then tried. Yeah, well, this guy got really screwed. He spent three and a half years in jail. In his late 40s, had absolutely no criminal record. Uh, the system just really uh, didn't work for him. This is kind of a, a prosecu prosecutorial <laughs> bad faith. You know what, I don't want to say that either, but you know, he was indicted, the case went to trial, I can't how believe... Could, how could it be indicted, though? He, he's 6'4". You know what, that never came out. You can say he's can indict a ham sandwich, and he was the ham sandwich. Yeah, well, back up, you went to Middlesex, you went to Middlesex County, and that's where you got mentored by, by liberals, you say, but people wanted to win, great people. You said there were three main things you learned when you became a lawyer, when you were told. Uh, one, know what... Whatever, anytime you ask me, this is more than that. There's a lot of great advice. But what, what's some of the great advice you got early on? Well, when I first started out, when you're meeting with people, and I was as raw as raw could be. I mean, I grew up in the suburbs. I went to PDS. I didn't know anything about this. So, I, uh, one of the men who mentored me said, "Whenever you meet with a client, make sure you, you start off by saying, what's your jacket like?' Which is slang for criminal record." Right. You had to know the lingo. You had to know what's a jacket. It's the first thing I learned, what's a jacket. And also, how much, when they can get paroled, that's called the step. Step. You know what the parole eligibility is. Um, so, I mean, you look, one of the reasons why I wrote the book also is kind of, I learned a lot of tricks along the way, and I try to put those in. And nothing illegal, it's just no, some things you learn, how to pick a jury, 
how to give openings, how to give summations, how to talk to clients, that sort of thing. Yeah, so uh, I, I like the one you said, anytime you have good news for a client, always ask for money. Absolutely. It is a business. You want to make a living. You know, we got families to support. Now, picking jury, um, um, jury here in Mercer <laughs> County, who are you looking for? I'm looking for Jews. I'm looking for African Americans. I'm looking for uh, people who are liberals. I'm looking for people from Princeton. Uh -huh. Unfortunately, the prosecutor's office tends to knock off people from Princeton. Uh, you know, those are the people. It's not not being racially using stereotypes. Those three folks, I, types of folks I mentioned, they're much more likely to take um, the um, preponderance of the evidence and beyond a reasonable doubt seriously, as opposed to, you know, I have kind of a general rule that if I see someone in the potential juror. I think they might have voted for me when I was running for office. I don't want them in that box. Mm -hmm. 